Good morning and welcome to Truth Point Church. We are so glad that you guys are here this morning. Uh, and I'm just privileged that I get to do the welcome with you this morning, my friends. Um, I, my name is Brooke, and um, for those of you that just came in, you should have gotten a worship guide. This is everything that you'll need for the service today. It has all of our announcements. It has uh, the, the lyrics to the songs, the responsive reading, and everything we'll need for this morning. But I do want to draw your attention to the announcements page. We do have quite a few, so I want to go through some of them with you. The first thing is, if you're new with us, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. Uh, the first thing, I just encourage you, if you haven't, even if you've been here a few months, if you haven't filled out a Connect card, there's a digital one here in, in the bulletin. So you can scan the little QR code and fill out a little form. It comes actually right to my desk, and I can send a welcome email and help you guys get connected here. Um, with all the things we have going on at the church. Um, the other thing, um, if you wanted to fill out a physical Connect card, they are out in the lobby as well, so I know some people prefer to do that. I do just want to ask, um, you'll see it in there, no food or drink in the sanctuary. It's a little weird, but it's actually for, uh, <laughs> for the sake of the Rosarians' leadership. We want to be so respectful to this wonderful um, facility that they're loaning to us. So uh, if you could just um, plan to drink all your beverages and eat your sandwiches or whatever you're bringing in with you before you come to the service, that would be just really respectful to, um, to the people that we're renting from here. So uh, the next thing is meal trains. So we don't always announce this, but this is actually a really tangible need we have here at Truth Point. So um, speaking of, I think we had three babies born just this week at our church. So <laughs> very exciting. Um, and uh, another one due any minute now. So um, very, very exciting. But meal trains are for babies being born, families that are settling in with new kids, um, and illnesses and sickness and after surgeries and all sorts of things. So if you would like to serve in that way, we encourage you to email Stacy Knorr, and we'll get you guys on that email list. So anytime a need comes up, you'll be the first to receive that and know that you can sign up and serve a family in that way. The next thing is Mom's Morning Out. I think it's next Saturday, March 12th, 10 to 12, at Kathy Smythe's house. And that's a great way for moms to connect and have a fellowship time together. Um, and they are also doing parenting conversations and going through a little study together as well. Uh, the next thing, actually, is the membership class. So we do these uh, every couple months. So another, this one's going to be on Thursday night. They do change occasionally depending on the day of the week. And so this one is March 24th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. And it's a great time to get to know about our church. You don't have to become a member just because you go to the class. But it's a great way to learn about us, what we believe, why we do things the way that we do, and to just learn more about the church. So if you haven't participated in a class, we encourage you to do that. Just send that email to info at truthpoint.org and I'll get you signed up for it. Um, the last announcement I have is for offerings. You'll see that we don't actually pass a plate here at Truth Point, but if you do want to give and you want to support our ministries, you can do so by uh, giving online at our, um, on our website, truthpoint.org backslash give, or um, there's an offering box in the lobby as well. Uh, and for our last announcement, I'll pass things over to Pastor Tim. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke, and good morning, everybody. Welcome once again. Welcome if you're joining us online uh, this morning as we come together to worship. And the last announcement is the one that, uh, that draws us into worship here together. So you stand up with me. Here at Truth Point, we remind ourselves in our announcements of the great good news that brings us here. And that is that Jesus Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. And that good news, that is, that is what is the foundation of our being able to come together here to be able to worship. And so let's do that. Hear this call to worship from the Psalms. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all God. Let's worship our great God and King this morning. Let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 
Sing holy. Amen. You can have your seats. Well, welcome once again. Uh, my name is Matt Greenberg, and I'm one of the elders here at Truth Point, and I get to lead us in our pastoral prayer this morning. But before we go to our Lord in prayer, I just wanted to, uh, to give you guys an update. It's kind of neat because our, our missionaries give us uh, updates overseas uh, about what's going on, and uh, this was a, an update from Jake and Kate Grice. They, uh, they did do a, a Jesus film project, and uh, they say it continues to bless unreached people groups. In India, a group of dangerous radicals heard a group of Christians were coming to their village for a second time to give food and relief to those suffering from COVID. The radicals invited the Christians into their homes, shared with them that they typically have beaten Christians in the past, but this time they inquired to know more. They asked, but now you have come back. And we want to know why. What kind of love do you have? We want to know more. We want to know about this Jesus. The group of tr Christians were then able to show them the Jesus film on a tablet with a Bluetooth speaker privately in their home. Since then, seven other nearby villages have been shown the Jesus film. And new believers in the area are asking them to show Jesus to everyone. Amen. Let's, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Sweet Lord, you fill our hearts up with gladness, but more than that, you fill the empty cup of salvation that we raise to you. You sustain us, Lord, and it is in you and through you that we have our being. And Lord, we ask that our sin would break our hearts and you would help us turn away from those sins that are keeping us from truly worshiping you this morning. Lord, we get bogged down with all the things we need to do each day that we often forget to praise you in the simple everyday blessings you give us. Lord, would you allow us to be captive in the moment that we can praise you for all that you continue to do in our lives. We confess that we don't always feel your presence in our lives and look to other things to fill our empty cups of salvation. Lord, we petition you knowing that we don't have to be perfect to earn your favor but we long to feel your presence. We long for right fellowship with you. And so we take a few moments now to confess silently to you anything that's burdening us. And Father, we praise you because every sin that was just confessed is forgiven for those who are in Christ. We hold fast to your promise that, we can, that if we confess our sins to you, you are just to forgive. We praise you for raising up faithful deacons that are so willing to be your hands and feet through tangible means in the church. Thank you for their service to your body as we continue to grow in maturity. Continue to use them in all of the ways they care for the church. 
And Lord, we also praise you for your provision in bringing about our new lead pastor, Matt Yusey, and his family. Gracious God, would you be their strength in the coming months as they begin to move their, uh, begin their move to the mainland. We lift up Family Church and their pastor, Jimmy Scroggins. We thank you for their desire to take part in the Great Commission in continuing to spread the gospel. Continue to give them opportunities for boldness in your name. And Lord, we also pray for our missionaries, Jake and Kate Grice, as they continue to preach the gospel to those people groups who are unreached, but you have given them an opportunity to further your kingdom. We praise you that the Grice family is also growing, that Kate is pregnant with a baby boy due in June. We ask for your continued uh, health in her pregnancy and preparations for a smooth transition as the baby joins their family. And Father, we close our time of prayer by pe praying as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our responsive reading this morning comes from Psalm 121 and we'll read the whole chapter. I'll give you a, a little bit of time to get to it, but it's also in our bulletin, and that's for, your, for everybody, including myself, so I don't miss, uh, miss any verses. Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. My help comes from the Lord. He will not let your foot be moved. Behold, he who keeps Israel. The Lord is your keeper. The sun shall not strike you by day. The Lord will keep you from all evil. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. Please stand as we continue to worship our Lord.
The night is dark.
race is complete. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Welcome once again, everybody joining online as we come together to worship this morning. And for the kids, it's every other time. I forgot the last time, so remembering this time, you guys are dismissed. That's the best I can do, even with practice. Um, if you're joining with us, we, we're, we're glad to have you here at Truth Point. I'm Tim Sansbury and uh, served as interim pastor for a long time here, continuing to fill the pulpit uh, while you guys are in this transition. And, and it's great news to hear, that, um, to hear that the call has been made. And I know there'll still be this kind of last time period of waiting um, but that's a, that's a huge step, but I'm, I'm, I'm so happy for God's providence to the church. As we open up the, our Bibles this morning, um, we're going to be continuing our series on the Psalms, and we're going to be looking at Psalm 131. If you'd like to, because as you see this in the bulletin, it's a pretty short one, um, if, you, if you've got your Bibles with you and you want to stick your fingers into 2 Timothy 4 and Isaiah 30, we'll be looking there later, but I'll have the references for you. Um, but this Psalm is about humility. And it's really quick about humility before God. But what we're going to do as we open up this morning is, since humility is kind of this coming away from our pride and our arrogance, we're going we're to talk first to kind of set it up about some kinds of pride that we can struggle with in the church. Um, some kinds of pride. And I'm, I'm going to talk about intellectual pride, idea pride. I'm going to talk about right behavior pride, ethical pride. And I'm going to talk about activity pride, like doing stuff pride, and ways those can fit in the church. And we're, we're, as we do that, you know, pride's an interesting thing because we, we really kind of, I think we, we both love it and we hate it. We, we both love it, and even in other people, we kind of love it and hate it at the same time. Um, I've referenced this a couple of times. For those of you that have listened to the podcast that's on the rise and fall of Mars Hill, the Mars Hill Church podcast, the really fascinating thing that came out in that podcast was that here's this church, and it started by it started in what seemed to be a really, a, a, a really God-centered way to focus on preaching the gospel. And you had a flawed leader, like everybody's flawed in the church, but that over time, success and gospel success and people coming to Christ grew in such a way that, that his pride kind of took over. His pride kind of took over. And the podcast did a really good job of chronicling the fact that as that happened, you have all these people that are saying, why did we do this? It actually wasn't all laid on his pride. It was people like us that were saying, I don't know what was going on. As he, as in his flaws, as his arrogance grew, as his self-centeredness grew, they said, I participated. I kept playing along. I kept, I liked it. I was excited. I said, well, there's some people getting hurt over here, but look at all this great stuff that's happening. And there was this way in which it was, it was people like you and me confessing, I loved his pride, and I shared his pride, and I got behind his pride. But the other thing about it is, we, while on the one hand, we can get, like, we can love pride in ourselves and others and say it's confidence and it's bold and it's wonderful, we also love seeing pride come to an end. And that's why the podcast exists, right? We, that's why we listen to it, because pride also fell. And yeah, look at that, that guy. You know, it took years, but God finally did it, and he came down, and all the other proud people will too. We love pride, and we hate pride in ourselves and in others. Pride's an interesting thing, but pride sometimes stands out like that. It's big and bold. You may know there's a, there's a lot of people in the history of church that have tried to identify pride as the source of all of our sin. I'm not asking you to get on board with that, but I'll say much of our pride is not big and bold. In fact, much of our pride often masquerades as godliness. It looks like doing the right thing. And as we go through this, I'll try to highlight these different categories of pride for us, give us some ways to examine it, but also show there's the big, bold way that's really obvious, but there's also the subtle ways that can, that can bring themselves into the church and, uh, and, and take away from our ability to do what this psalm is going to talk about in terms of going up with a spirit of humility, to worship. So as we get ready to read it, this, like last week, this is also a psalm of ascent. 
So this is, uh, this is a psalm that's written by David, and this is a psalm that people would have sung together. And so as we've talked through the psalms about the idea of putting it on, this is something, as you think about, if I were saying these words, it's not something you would say because you finally got there necessarily. This is the kind of psalm that you would say because you're trying to get there. You're coming into worship. You're calling yourself in. You're reminding yourself, I need to be humble. I'm not humble. It'd be reminding yourself to, to examine yourself for pride. It would be part of a process as we're, we're going into worship, so we're going to sing about being humble because we want to be humble, not because we already are, right? If you know David's life well, you know that he did not fully achieve humility in his lifetime. He struggled with pride frequently. And we struggle with pride frequently, but we put this psalm on as a way to carry us in to say, I'm going to look intentionally for pride. And Lord, when I come before you, I confess I'm proud and I want to be humble and I want to see myself in this imagery that we've got. So let's hear it. It's very short. Oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. And that would, you could also translate that my heart is not haughty. My heart is not proud. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you will open up your word to us this morning. Lord, help us to um, hear not only the words of this psalm, but also to examine ourselves for pride in these, in these ways that we can become taken over with putting ourselves ahead of you, with seeking to become like you, with, with even forgetting that you're there and thinking that it's up to us to know or up to us to, up to, us to decide right and wrong, up to us to act and to change the world. But help us to live with you in a, in a spirit of humility, seeing ourselves, seeing our souls like that weaned child being carried by a parent and not as the one leading the show. In the, your name we pray. Amen. So uh, we're going we're gonna to go to two places here, and I wish all three of the things that I'm, that I'm selecting here were in one spot. They're not. Um, we're going to start off in 2 Timothy 4, and there's a text there, and I want to read it to you. So I'm going to be reading 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, and it's fairly straightforward. If you've got your Bibles, you can read through it. If not, just listen. And this, this first one is going to deal with an issue of sort of intellectual pride, intellectual pride. And intellectual pride is pretty common. We can all kind of get it. If you've got an area of specialization, an area you work, you know, it's really easy to get caught up in pride. And when you're, you know, even in the church, that can happen. And so the, the pursuit of understanding God can end up turning you into somebody who struggles with a new sin because you've learned more. When I, when I said I was going to seminary, my mom said, please no. I mean, she was like half crying and said, everybody who goes off to seminary comes back a pompous jerk. And she actually... That was, that's nicer than what she said. I've only heard her cuss twice. Once was at me, and that was the second time. She did not like what had, she had seen when people went to seminary. That, that, that pride had puffed them up, and it wasn't because they came back wrong. It was because they came back right. But seeing that rightness in a way that puffed them up and made them grand and kept them from being able to apply it well within the church as a human being. So let's hear this in 2 Timothy 4. Um, this is Paul speaking to Timothy, but we can hear in it. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Here it is. For the time is coming, and I would say, and has now come, when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Now listen, there's, so there's two things going on there. One of them is a charge to Timothy to preach the word well, sober-minded, enduring suffering, not haughty and puffed up, but there's also a command to him to do that to an audience of people who, in their pride, don't want to hear the truth. So if you remember the beginning, I said we're going to have this kind of sanctified pride and the sort of obviously broken pride. Let's start with the obviously broken pride. And I love this image of the itching ears. Right? Itching ears. What does that mean? Like, I want to hear words that agree with what I already think. 
And wow, our culture right now, this is such a thing in our culture right now, right? We have a culture in which people already know about everything. And everybody's an expert on masks. Everybody's an expert on vaccines. Everybody's an expert on foreign war policy. Everybody's an expert, and you can stay an expert really well because you go on Twitter and you find anybody who agrees with you, and you retweet it to all your friends that also already agree with you, and you share all this stuff, and you just fill your mind up with stuff that already agrees with what you think. Or you, you look for people who disagree with you but do it in ridiculous ways and are obviously broken and you share that out so it says also, it reaffirms, I'm getting what I already wanted. But we do this, this happens in the church, this is in the arrogant pride, and the running away pride. This was a constant struggle, this language of looking for prophets to, um, to say the words people wanted to hear was a huge struggle in the Old Testament. It's a struggle in the New Testament. My tape is bad. If, if anybody's back there and give me some new one, that's why I'm fiddling with the mic so much. Um, do a little bit of a, we're going to fix things with duct tape during the service. If we need, if I have a Swiss Army knife, if I have any other problems, we'll be good. Be like MacGyver. Um, this, this idea of, that'll, that'll be good. All right. Probably not there. All right. Sorry about that. A little, a little brief moment. I'm sweating too much, I guess. This, this arrogance of not wanting God's truth, not wanting God's truth, not being submissive to God's word not being submissive to what God has taught, not being submissive to the authority of the church, but actually saying, I don't want that to be true. I don't want that to be true. So I'm going to go and I'm going to find somebody who will tell me what I want to hear. Now, in the church, we do that. That can seem like it's just an outside the church kind of thing. But if you examine your lives, if we think about this psalm as one that if we're going to put these words on, we're going to examine ourselves. Start thinking about spiritual truth, about theological truth. Are, are you reading scripture and let that, letting that be your authority? Or are you looking for people who agree with other ideas that you've already got and trying to hold scripture at bay? Are you actively seeking, I, I'm struggling with this. I want somebody to tell me what I already think is true. I want somebody to tell me what I already think is true. I think it's commonplace. I think we, we, that's a natural desire to have an itching ear that just wants to be reinforced in what's been misled. And so in this arrogant form of the pride, the arrogant pride, we are actually willfully looking for somebody to tell us what Scripture doesn't say. But then the second aspect of the pride, which kind of is the sandwich around it, is the more spiritualized one, the one that looks good, the one in which we actually do seek the real truth, the one in which we do know. We came back from seminary. We've got the truth. We know what the truth is, but still, we don't carry that truth into the body of Christ like people who've been given a gift that we can share. We carry it through in a way that makes us spiritually proud. I have no falsehood in me, even if I, no, that's not true, but if I had no, like, to think this sort of like, I've got it all lined out, I've got it completely right, and I'm going to fix all these people, right? You all become a project. You all become a project. Every error becomes an opportunity to speak the truth in, no matter the form. See, Timothy is being told by, by Paul to speak to people who need the truth. But he's being told to do it humbly. He's being told to do it humbly and to expect suffering as he does. Speak the word, but speak the word humbly. Speak the word humbly as a servant of God and not as God incarnate. The next kind is one that I think many of you will identify with in the world around you, and we can then, when we do the work, we can identify it ourselves. So I said the first is intellectual pride or idea pride. I next want to think about ethics pride, right and wrong pride. Ethics pride or, um, or, or right and wrong pride. And Isaiah 30, Isaiah 30 is one of the most, to me, one of the most incredible chapters in scripture. If you haven't read through it lately, Isaiah 30 is dealing with the Israelites when they were worried about Assyria attacking them. And God had said, I'm going to protect you. And Israel, af afraid for their lives, they kind of said, I, we, we thank you, God, but we're also going to go talk to Egypt, and we're going to try to get Egypt to help us. And so God is, through Isaiah, is confronting Israel for the fact that they weren't, they weren't willing to trust in him. 
They weren't willing to trust in him. And so the first part, and we're going to hear echoes of Timothy, the first thing I'm going to read is Isaiah 30, 8 through 11. And this, is the, this deals with the people of Israel with respect to their, their, their sense of right and wrong, their activity, right and wrong behavior. And now, go, write it before them on a tablet and describe it in a book, that it may be for a time to come as a witness forever. For they are a rebellious people, lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see. And to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. Leave the way. Turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. This one, this here, is not so much about ideas and intellect and truth. And of course, Timothy's would apply to what we ought to do. But this is very specific to how they were supposed to behave. And notice what the people are doing. The arrogant version here is they're willfully saying, They're willfully saying, don't see to the seers. Don't speak truth to the prophets. They're shoving it away. Many of you have probably seen people in crisis. I I know that I certainly have. People who are in a crisis of conscience where they have a situation in their life in which the right thing is the hard thing. And you say, but, and, and they're saying, I want to do the easy thing. I want to go the easy way. I want to run away. And they've been in the church. They've been with you. You've seen them. You've walked with them. You know they know the truth. Maybe you've even heard them tell other people the truth. But when you bring the truth to them, they say, don't talk to me about that. I don't want to hear that. Don't talk to me about that. You either support me and encourage me in what I'm doing or get out of my life. There are people, we do this arrogant, refusing to see God's way in which we look into the word we see what we don't want and we say i refuse to hear that which we say to the people around us don't speak truth to me don't speak truth to me i don't want to hear it now it's obvious when it's bold and it's arrogant that way but this was the whole nation of israel it also happens in more subtle ways within the church when we try to preach through the whole word of god there's always aspects of what god teaches that don't fit with the culture around us And in the church, there can be pressures placed on the church. Hey, don't teach that. Don't teach that. That seem like they're spiritual. They seem like they're really nice and friendly. They seem like they're good. They seem like they're gospel-minded. Our culture right now doesn't agree very much with what the Bible teaches about sex, with what the Bible teaches about gender, with the Bible teaches about marriage, And sex is something that only belongs in marriage and about gender as being part of the initial creation. And we have places, we have churches, it's probably happened here. I have felt this way. Absolutely I have felt this way where I think, you know, I want to make sure people feel welcome. I want to make sure they can come in. I want to make sure that we speak to this culture well. Maybe we'll just teach that gently. Maybe we just won't teach that part. Maybe we'll just speak a little differently. See, we, we start to decide, you know what the culture needs? It's not what God has given them in his word. You know what the culture needs? They need a little less. They need a little softening. They, the right and wrong, right and wrong in the Bible, that's too much. That's too hard. Let's just, let's just scale it back a little bit so nobody gets hurt. But listen, when we do that, even in that subtle way that sounds like it's for people, And maybe it's even in that one-on-one relationship where somebody says, don't speak the truth to me. And we say, I want to stay friends with them, so I'm not going to. Look what we're doing. We're placing ourselves above God. God gave us this word. And we're saying, I'm not all of it, God. Not right now. It's not the right time. It has the feel of the gospel. But it has the reality of arrogance and pride in setting ourselves and our understanding of the truth above. God has revealed. The last, uh, the last of these is activity pride. And I want to separate activity here out from right and wrong. I mean, your, your ethical behavior is right and wrong. But there's also, there are many actions that we take in which there is no clear right answer. There's no clear right answer. Where morality can be placed aside, and it's just about whose job is this? Are we going to do something? Again, looking in Isaiah 30, this is what the Israelites 
were struggling with. There's nothing wrong. Israel was allowed to have military. I mean, they, they could have had a military arrangement where they said to Egypt, hey, let's fight together against Assyria. At that point in time, that, that's, that kind of a treaty in and of itself wouldn't have been wrong. But God said, I'm going to do it for you. And they said, all right, God, listen, we'll take all your help. And you know what's even better than your help is your help plus Egypt. Like, I mean, it's like math is obvious. Like God, we've already got God. And now we can do God plus one. What could possibly go wrong? Like, we're going to just add, we're going to help him out. We're going to do a little bit more. And so here, um, here in, in Isaiah 30, I'm going to read one through three. And then I'm going to read again uh, 15 and 16, which I think is just so devastating. But, but listen here, Isaiah 31 through 3. Ah, stubborn children, declares the Lord, who carry out a plan but not mine, who make an alliance but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who set out to go down to Egypt without asking for my direction and take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the protection of Pharaoh turn to your shame and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt to your humiliation. And now skipping down to 15. For thus said the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved, in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. But you were unwilling, and you said, no, we will flee upon horses, therefore you shall flee away, and we will ride upon swift steeds, therefore your pursuers shall be swift. See, what, what, what's happening here is an unwillingness to rest in the Lord. And this, I think, is a really interesting and very subtle struggle for us in the church. I've, I've heard several commentators say that, that in the church, especially because we're so wealthy and that it's a consistent piece, and you may not feel wealthy, but compared to, compared to all of history and all of the world and almost everyone even today, the fact that we're here, we're wealthy. I'm not worried about my daily bread, right? You're probably not worried about your daily bread. You, you may be worried, depending on how your retirement situation is, about your bread next month. Or maybe you're worried about your bread in 10 years. Maybe you're worried about your bread in retirement. But it's very unlikely anyone here is really not sure whether they'll eat tomorrow. Rents and car payments. We've probably got people that are in financial crisis right now. But many people at the time the Bible was being written, they lived a daily life of worry about their next day's bread. And that part of what that does is it, it takes away our sense of walking with God. It takes away our sense of walking with him on a day-to-day -day basis. It takes away our sense of need for him. It takes away our reliance on him. And what God tends to do is he kind of tends to become really far distant in terms of fixing things in the world. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a kind of religion called deism in which God just started the world and then he starts it and it's all going to go the way he wants to and he kind of sits back and watches. And, and Christians would say, that's wrong. Right? And the arrogant form of this activity pride would be to embrace on purpose something like deism where we say it's all up to us and we have to do it. But the everyday subtle way is, you know, God, I, I, I pretty much got this. And God, I know you're out there and I know you're good. And, and we do, there is a sense of Jesus being close by. He's a comfort. He's sort of an ethical comfort, a moral comfort. But in terms of the activity in the world, God gets really far away. And what it, what it starts to look like, the way as you examine yourself, as you look for this pride, one of the things you can look for is when things get hard, when things get really hard, not, not quite impossible though, when things are just really hard, does that make you pray more? Or do you start praying less because you've got stuff to do? See, I see this one in myself all the time. If things are impossible, this is impossible. So where do I go? Well, God, you're in charge of impossible. So then I can get called into prayer with impossibility. But now it may be weeks and months even of thinking it's not quite impossible before I really get there. But I get to the place where it's like, okay, God, impossible is up to you. But when things are a little bit hard, when things are a little bit hard, then it's like I got to figure this out. I got to figure out what to do. Things are really hard. I really got to figure out what to do. This is going to take a long time. I need to talk to some other people. We need to strategize together. We need to figure this out. And boy, you know, I know God wants us to do what's right. And so let's make sure that we work together really hard to figure out what to do. 
See, what, what tends to happen is God is really far away, and he's paying attention to you. So this is in the church. It feels good. God's given us a job. He's given us a job to do. He's got this problem he's brought into my life. He's given me right, a sense of right and wrong. He's given me a community of people. He's given me... He's given me tools and wisdom and intellect and whatever skills you've got. And so he set the problem in front of me, and it's my problem. So then, like Israel, right, like Israel, rather than being able to say, hey, God, I, I need to come to you because maybe you don't want me to solve this. Maybe you just want me to rest, be still, and let you be God. What we do is we don't have time to go to God because he gave us a problem and we've got to go fix it. And in the arrogance of our heart, what we start doing is we start looking at ourselves as Egypt or our friends as Egypt or other people. We're trying to recruit Egypt. We're trying to recruit, okay, God's got it in the big picture and now I've got to get my God plus one because God's not enough. I've got to figure it out. I've got to work it out. God's not fully here. And so problems that ought to drive us to the Lord end up driving us away from him because we're proud, because we really don't see him as here. We see him as far away because we do have so many tools to fix so many problems that until God makes it impossible, we just don't really believe we need him. But those, those three prides bring us back to the psalm. And I want to focus in, so verse 1 focuses on the idea of I'm not proud right now. But I want to talk a little bit here and go back and look at verse 2. But I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like, the, like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. There's another translation that, that this imagery as it's translated over. L listen to this. Uh, no, I have composed and quieted my soul like a wean child carried by his mother. Like the wean child I carry is my soul. That the, the imagery, remember a psalm of ascents, and so we're going together up to worship. And there would be children, a wean child, so probably three to five years old is kind of the imagery there, but still being carried. That the, the idea of coming into worship is one of reminding ourselves not that we're soldiers for Christ. That imagery is biblical at times. Not that we're workers. Not that we've got to get it all figured out. Not that we're on our own to determine right and wrong. Not that when there's trouble, it's always our job to fix it. But that part of the image, part of our imagery when we come to worship is that we are a child being carried. Not even walking alongside. Being carried in a backpack. See, the gospel... The gospel isn't a, isn't a message of figure it out and know or you fail. The gospel isn't even a message of get all of your right and wrong down exactly right and then you'll be okay. It's not a message of doing a lot of good things and getting them all done. We, we encourage everyone to grow in their theological understanding. We want, Timothy was told, encourage each other to right behavior. The Israelites are being told, you're, like, what's wrong with you? You're going to go off into captivity because you're sinning so much. And we ought to be doing things. The church is called into action. It's not that these things are wrong. It's that when we place our hope in them, then it becomes about us and God is out there at the end, far away. If my hope is in my intellect, if that's how I'll be right with God, then i got to get to it, and I've got to go. I've got to learn. And if you've got problems and I want you to go with me, I've got to fix you now because you're broken because we have to do this. We have to know this. We have to understand this. And you notice it makes it about me. If for me to get right with God involves me knowing well enough, I have to be focused on me. Do I know well enough? Do I understand well enough? In right and wrong, in ethics, am I obeying enough? In activity, have I done enough? Am I working hard enough? Am I devoted to my family enough? Am I devoted to my kids enough? Am I devoted to my job enough? Did I study enough for this sermon? Did I listen well enough to this sermon? Did I pay attention? Did I read my Bible? Did I miss my days? Did I skip a workout? It's on me. 
when we understand Christianity as being a religion of doing first, then it does make it about you, and pride is necessary. But see, in the psalm, my soul is being carried by Christ. I recognize myself, a weaned child being carried by my God, to go where? To go up into worship. We've seen this message over and over again in the Psalms, but here it is once again. It's not that we don't seek to know. It's not that we don't try to do what's right. It's not that we don't work for the gospel. It's that we do it as people who already know, I'm being carried by my God. My identity is as his child. If you're here and you know Christ, you are his child. You do not go and learn to be right with him. Go and learn as one carried to the library, carried to the books with the opportunity to grow. If you know Christ, if you follow him, then he's made you his child and he carries you. So you, he, as, as, a, as a child of God, seek to live right, submitting to the God who already set you free from your sin. If you're being carried as his child, know that as a child... Hey, listen, if God tells you to put some stuff together, if he tells you to do some work, then do it. But remember, you're the child stacking some bricks. And God is the builder who's making the house. A child carried along. If you don't know Christ, let me tell you, this is who he is. Our God that we worship, the Lord and Savior that we worship, is one who said, I love you. You are broken. If you come here and you hear the right and wrong, you hear the law, even this message of pride, if you realize I am so pr proud, I am running away, I am trying to know on my own, I am trying to do and to fix. What Christ will say to you is not just do a little better next time, just do a little better. He'll say, you're failing. It's never going to work. Stop it. But then he's going to say, but I'll set you free right now. When we set our hope in Christ, he says, I will carry you. I will set you free from all that guilt. I will set you free from all that shame. I'll put you in the backpack, and I'll carry you up the hill. You'll be my child. And as my child, you'll be called into this kingdom of people, this group of people, who are still flawed and still broken and still walking up the hill together and have to be reminded of their pride, but you'll be somebody set free. And that when you die, you will be carried in and standing before God after death. You will be able to wear Christ's righteousness because of the life that he lived and stand before God and have him say, I love you. You are mine. Carried in. So, oh, Israel... Verse 3, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. If you call on Christ's name, if you have called on Christ's name, then he promises he is faithful to forgive. And you are his. Your image of yourself is not your sin, your shame. It's not your pride, your arrogance. The image of you is Christ's child carried up to worship. You are his, and he sees himself in you. So let us hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for this, this short psalm. Lord, as we, as we put this psalm on, I pray that you'd help us to be, to be reminded that we are proud. To be reminded that pride is not always big and showy. Sometimes pride seems very spiritual and good. Sometimes pride seems like it's looking out for others. Sometimes pride seems like it's looking for you. Lord, reveal to us not just our big pride, not just our arrogance, but also reveal our subtle pride. Lord, help us to want to seek to know you better, but not to cause division or to be willful and become an authority, but that we can help the church to grow. Lord, help us to seek what's right and wrong, not so that we can be justified, but because we are justified. Lord, help us, call us into the activity of your church, show us when it's our job, but remind us always 
that ultimately you are in charge. Call us into prayer. And don't let the work take over and set you far off on a distant hill. For we pray all these things in your name. Amen. I didn't see anybody up here, and I was like, wait. Okay, so if the ushers want to come forward with that little quick delay, I'll tell you what, you let a guy go, and he just falls apart. <laughs> this is our time to celebrate that truth, that God does take our sin through his death, that he does set us free. This, this act of communion, this celebration is called a sacrament, which means a mystery. And part of the mystery of it is...
by your word. is that it empowers us to look deeply at our sin. It empowers us to see the depth of our pride. It empowers us to really examine ourselves for failures and flaws. Because Christ has said, I'll cover it all. The bigger your sin is, the bigger the cross is. When in pride you cover it up and you make it little, you actually make the cross little too. You need a little savior. And I'm telling you, you need a big savior but I'm also telling you God's word says you have a big Savior. As you think on your sin, as you reflect on pride, on any sin, let it go deep. Because the deeper it goes, the bigger Christ is. Because he swears, he promises, he assures us. If you have set your mind on him, if you have called on him to save you, if you have clung to the cross and said, God set me free, he has set you free from all of it. And so go knowing that you have been set free. Not to go and fix it and be proud, but forever carried as his child. When you came in today, if you're his, that's how you came in, whether you felt it or not. You are his, carried by a perfect God and Savior. And so go out knowing that good news. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Go in peace and serve in every good work and word. Amen.